All right, let's get into this now. So understanding, understanding channel strategy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the very basics and help you to understand why this stuff is so vitally important. Why should we study marketing channels and why it is so valuable, especially now? And I don't need the last 15 years to teach you anything. So why do we study channels? One third of the world's business gross domestic product is in channels. So take whatever number you want to say. The United States economy is $26 trillion, one third of that, seven and a half, eight trillion dollars a year. That's enough for me to consider that to be important. Realize also that channels represents the gatekeepers between the manufacturers and the end users. If you look at the chain, with the manufacturer at the top, the intermediaries in the middle, ultimately getting to the end user, it is this component that is extremely important and valuable to you. They can either mean success or utter failure. The consumer's experience <clears throat> And the channel experience strongly affects the consumer perception of the manufacturer's brand image. Anybody in here own a Lexus or family owned a Lexus? Okay. When Lexus came out, Lexus said, we will guarantee the first three years of oil changes every 5,000 miles. Just a fact. You don't need to write that down. So what it meant is, is that if you owned a Lexus, you could go in to the dealership and get a free oil change for the first three years or 36,000 miles, whichever came first. Anybody want to guess the cost of material for an oil change? Just a guess. Five quarts of oil and one oil filter. Yeah, maybe at the most, especially yeah. oil now, and especially it's mostly synthetic. That's a good guess. Okay. Generally, oil, if, if you get somebody to change it for you, it's like 69 bucks, something like that. They don't make a lot on them. It takes 15 minutes to do an oil change, but look what they got to do. They got to do two things. The Lexuses were just rolled out. They were brand new machines. They had no idea whether they were going to succeed. What's the first thing? That a service department will do when you bring your car in. Anybody want to guess? They take and they hook it into their computer systems and they start reading the data off of those machines. Now think about that as an automobile dealership and think of you're trying to create quality with the Lexus. It means that tens of thousands of Lexuses that are out on the road, they're collecting information that information gets sent to the dealerships and the dealership sends all that information upstream. That's invaluable information. And it cost them only 50 bucks for the uh, material. It was a genius strategy by Lexus. And also what it did was it allowed them to create a perception of value with Lexus that's unmatched. Toyota, by the way, is one of my personal favorite corporations. The Toyotas in Brazil, now think about this. The Toyotas in Brazil are made completely different than the Toyota is made anywhere else in the world. Why? Because the roads that they have basically are a substandard. And so the um, chassis and the shock absorber systems on Toyotas are much stiffer than anywhere else in the world. Now think about a corporation that cares enough about their customers that they're willing to build a completely different car for a different country. That is an amazing company. Although Tesla is the number one manufacturer in the world in terms of total dollars, Toyota sells anywhere from 12 to 15 billion cars a year. That's pretty darn good, okay? So short answer is the channel experience affects that perception. And the other thing about this is it is a very underutilized source of sustainable competitive advantage. 
<clears throat> Anybody ever heard of steel tools? S-T-I-H-L. Anyone own one? Cost you some money, didn't it? Steel tools cost 50% more than the average Husqvarna or any of the others, but they sell year after year after year. Why? Because steel tools are only sold through independent dealerships, and you cannot go into a steel dealership and buy a chainsaw unless they're sure that you know which end to point. Anybody ever run a chainsaw? Scared the hell out of them, didn't it? Scared me the first time. I wish I'd have had somebody to tell me what's the proper way to hold it, how to oil it, where to put gas in it. Those are the kinds of things. And that's why steel is able to demand 50% more than anyone else. There's a lot of requirements to be a steel dealership, but it pays off in the long run. And so what this ultimately comes down to is that a strong channel system is a strong source of sustainable competitive advantage. And what does sustainable mean? It means that your competition can't copy it. Competitive advantages are easily copied, but sustainable ones aren't. And usually that has to do with perception. Those individuals in here with apples, the Microsoft and the Dells, Hewlett Packards, the average margin on those are 6% in terms of if you buy one for $1,000, Hewlett Packard gets $60, $60 out of a $1,000 purchase. With an Apple, a $1,000 machine will yield 35%. In other words, Apple gets 350 bucks. Why? Because for you, it's worth it. It's as simple as that, okay? Distribution is thought of as a necessary evil, but it can be much more effective than that if you give it thought, okay? It is another problem or another thought about a good dealership system is that it's not easily replicated. And so we're going to talk about this later, but place is the most expensive and the most uh, difficult to change of all of the four Ps. Anybody want to guess what's the easiest of the four Ps to change? You got one out of three options. Which one's the easiest? Which one? Yes, exactly. It's as simple as that. It's so easy to change price, okay? But place, forget it. And it has to do with a basic definition. So what is marketing channel strategy? Channels is part of the four elements, price, gross, price, product, promotion, and place. What marketing channels are, they are a series of interdependent organizations, interdependent defined as needing each other to succeed, that are involved in the process of making a product or service available for consumption. Interdependent means that each channel partner needs each other to do the job. And what is the job? This is the job, to make it available for consumption. All channel members, once again, this is a difference between a supply chain and channels. All channel members focus their attention on the end user. A marketing channel system is exactly what it sounds like. It is from firm to end. And this last part here, running a channel is a process, not an event. And if you understand what a process means, Iteratively, it means that it is a constant flowing circular flow. 
constantly moving and never ending. Which means that as things change, the channel system much, must change many times. And so what is the process? Well, just remember the distribution process many times takes time to accomplish. And even when the sale is made, the relationship is usually not over. As a matter of fact, as we all talk about the selling process, the post-purchase evaluation is vital for the success of long-term relationships. And so even when the sale is made, the relationship doesn't end. Walmart, for all of its disadvantages, has many blessings when it comes to their return policy. It is practically no questions asked other than clothing and computer software. And one of the cool thing Walmart does is that they'll give you cash if you'll take it, if they'll, if you'll take it, which I think is brilliant, okay? Remember that the end users in the market can be business users or consumers. We'll talk about the differences between the two, but basically a consumer all comes down to the bet, the buying motive. And, and that will not be a test question. You can just absorb that, okay? The buying motive of the consumer basically determines whether or not the good is for a consumer or for a business, okay? <laughs> And so this is the process. So ultimately, what are we trying to study? Well, first, we want to make sure always to focus attention on the end users. We must realize that the individuals in the marketing process have limited resources in which to invest with. Nobody has unlimited money. So what we want to be able to do is think about these things, tweak our environment so that we can reduce our cost of distribution. We can minimize competitive rivalry by doing things that are unique and different that our competitors can't. Increase our performance. And it's this thinking process that we want to do that ultimately lends the definition of marketing channel strategy. Yes, this is the definition you'll look for on the test. Marketing channel strategy is the set of activities that you marketing scholars will focus on when you design and manage a marketing channel to enhance the firm's sustainable competitive advantage and ultimately their financial performance. There's only one reason to be in business, folks. That's to increase your return on investment. We'll talk about that as well. We want to be able to design our marketing channels that maximizes our possibility of success. Now, this doesn't go off on the other day. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, are you a teacher that usually points out on those slides what's going to be the test? Yeah, I'll try to. Okay. okay. Now, of course, I must say very blandly that yes. everything I say could be on the test, okay? Um, but let me tell you also this. Points that are important, and I say this will be on the test, it'll be on the test, okay? So I, I'm going to point out once again that end users perform channel functions. You're going to hear me say it in the next 10 minutes. But I swear to you, I have students that miss that all the time, okay? So thank you for that question. The difficulty with saying that this is gonna be on the test and say, well, we didn't say it was gonna be on the test, okay? Hopefully what I'm saying means something. Okay, so this is your introduction to channels and channel strategy. So who are the participants in marketing channels? 
And so here we go with the next slide. And we're going to talk about these each one at a time. So don't feel like you've got to write everything down. This is the way the slides look, all right? We have the three entities in the marketing channel environment. And sometimes people will talk about the three entities on the test and they'll get the intermediaries mixed up. Intermediaries are only one group, folks. That's important to understand. There's only three. Manufacturers who are the prime movers who establish and maintain the links. We'll talk about channel captains in a second. The intermediaries and the end users. So those three, that's all you need to get from this slide. And now we'll go to the next one. <clears throat> and so what do we call a manufacturer? A manufacturer is the producer or originator of the product or service being sold. <clears throat> There's a lot of, we have used words interspersed over a hundred years about how we define what a manufacturer is. How can you define a manufacturer when in essence a manufacturer buys manufactured parts from other manufacturers? The best way to think about it is they're the top of the tree. They're the originator of that particular product or service, regardless of whether it is a collection of subassemblies or raw materials. Now, manufacturers can actually be two things. One of them is they could be a branded manufacturer. They sell their products with a brand name that is known by end users. Branded manufacturers have title of their particular goods. They have physical connection to them. They actively engage and seek in advertising to the end users. They are there to help and promote their systems down the tree. But there are also different manufacturers as well that are known as private label manufacturers. They don't invest in the building of a brand name, but they're there to be a subsidiary for other branded products. Anybody in here know ACES? You know the name. So you built, you used ACES before? Yeah, I've owned one. Okay, that's cool. So like ACES, when it came out, I used to work in a computer store, so I was one of those guys in my 20s building computers and that kind of stuff. That's what we did instead of building hot rock, it was cheaper. Um, but anyway, ACES as a manufacturer, when we would put together white boxes, one of the cool things about ACES was that the product was bulletproof. I could take a motherboard, slap it in a machine, and know it was going to work, you know, even past 200 hour burn it. So ASUS got this very good reputation going on, and eventually what happened is ASUS became a brand name of their own. I mean, they became that well known. So ASUS is an example of a private label manufacturer that actually became a brand name. They were that good. Um, when IBM was creating their ThinkPad, they had a corporation in Taiwan eventually after 2000 that was creating the ThinkPads called Lenovo. In 2007, when IBM decided they were going to get out of the PC business entirely, they took that entire and sold it over to Lenovo, and now Lenovo is a brand. So those are the way things can go, all right? It also, I should say as well, that the manufacturer, that the lack of a physical product to move through the system doesn't mean that service ch uh, channel companies have no channel design. H&R Block. H&R Block. Anybody know what H&R Block does? tax services, okay? H&R Block has their own channel environment. It's a franchise system. Just because they only sell a service doesn't mean they don't have a channel environment as well. And so those are manufacturers, okay? All right, so they are the manufacturer. Oh, before I go on, let's talk about what channel captains are. Channel captains, are those corporations that have the greatest investment 
in building the channel system. The channel captains are not necessarily the manufacturers. In 1996, in an article in the Harvard Business Review, was it Parisimon, I think it was, wrote an article that said that the power in the channels is no longer invested in the manufacturers. It is invested in one major retailer who in 1996 has become the dominant retailer in the United States. Does anybody want to guess who that was? 1996, past history. Got one in town. Walmart. Walmart, thank you. Thank you. Okay. That is an example of a channel captain that actually exists at the intermediary level. And because of their dominant footprint, they in essence have become the channel captains. All right. But please don't make the mistake of when you're talking about in the in the essay question when you're when I'm asking you about this structure, don't say is the channel captain, because that'll count a point or two against you. Okay. They could be. So manufacturer. Yes. So what specifically what would define the channel captain would just be like they make the decisions about what's coming in and what's the, the channel captain tends to be, as I, I've said before, the individual who has the greatest, what's the word I want to use? responsibility and development of the channel system itself. They, in essence, is exactly what it says. Walmart has built their own channel environment, literally independent of the manufacturers in which they work for. Okay, Now, they have good relationships with the vendors, but Procter & Gamble is not the driver of success for Walmart or the other way around. Procter & Gamble is one of the largest um, manufacturers in the world, too. But Procter & Gamble does not yank Walmart's chain. Consequently, Walmart doesn't yank Pro Procter & Gamble's chain, of course. But everything that flows from Walmart doesn't necessarily depend on the manufacturer. It's kind of that way of thinking. Of it, okay. Now, Apple, Apple is a channel captain, no doubt about it. They rule their world. All right, and that's kind of the way to think of it in that way. Apple chooses their own franchises, which now is like only education and Apple stores. Apple stores, by the way, are the number one, how do I say this? Revenue producing retail stores per square inch in the world. And that includes diamond stores, all right? That's how powerful Apple stores are now, okay? So channel captain is just the prime mover. They're the individuals who create the channel, channel environments in which they work, okay? It's a good question. So the next are intermediaries. And once again, uh, is a title slide. And we're gonna move to the next one. Intermediaries is, is kind of a broad term, and I really want you to hear this, hear the words coming out of my mouth. The intermediary is any other member that is not the manufacturer or end user. Any member who is not the manufacturer or the end user. It is important for you to understand that. Wholesalers and retailers are intermediaries, even though the retailer sells to the end user. And so we're going to talk about these one at a time. Once again, this is a filler slide. So let's talk about wholesalers. So wholesalers is a broad term. It can be merchant wholesalers, distributors, master distributors. They all have funny names. But the key thing about a wholesaler is the wholesaler does not sell to the end user. That's the key thing. A wholesaler takes title and physical possession of the inventory. That's very important because in taking title and physical possession, they have the ability to set 
crisis. Wholesalers are specialists. There are places like General Office Supply that have been around for decades, over 100 years, that sell to businesses that you can get practically anything from as generalists. But wholesalers generally have a specialized knowledge that makes them unique. What is their major functions is promotion and negotiation. So in other words, they go to other retail firms. They negotiate prices between other groups. And they promote new products from manufacturers downstream to the retailers. They, other have, they, they have other very valued functions that we'll talk about in a minute as well. One of those in that negotiation realize is not just negotiating, no, negotiating downstream to their partners, but negotiating upstream to manufacturers as well. I'm telling you, the wholesale game is a good one if you ever get into it, okay? The key thing just to remember with wholesalers is they do not sell to end users. Next is retail. Retail has a lot of names. There's department stores, mass merchandise, hypermarkets. They can be generalized uh, sellers, such as Walmarts. They can be specialized groups like foot sloggers or mass general store. But their key thing that they do all at the same time is that they sell to the end, in, end users or to individual customers. That's really the major thing about a retailer to understand. Retail, by the way, is still a big game. No matter how much they talk about retail outlets now, the fascinating thing is that people are returning to the stores and it is something to the effect of 86% of all retail sale, sales still go through stores. Why do retail still valuable again? I said this in a, in a class 10 years ago. I asked if in general, would you buy a tuxedo online or a wedding dress online? And I actually found a couple of people who did, so I should be watch what I say. What I mean basically is that is, is that items that are very personable require an individual to actually see it on themselves. And so if you buy a watch, the vast majority of watches are bought in stores because you want to see it next to your skin. Jewelry is the same thing. Clothes are the same thing. Okay. So yes, you can buy a tuxedo online. Try to, you know, try to fit it online too. Okay. Um, so there's still the desire and need to relate. There's a, there's a definition called the need to touch. We need and we have a desire to interact with the things physically that we have before we sell them. So retail has shifted, but it's still as big as it ever was. The last is, and this is a very fascinating group, are what are called specialized intermediaries. Why did you? So what is a specialized intermediary? A specialized intermediary very rarely gets into all of the interactive functions that happen in the channel system. And we'll talk about those. A specialized intermediary might handle just one single function in the channel environment. And so a credit card company that all that it does is process credit cards is an example of a specialized intermediary. When I worked offshore, uh, there are groups that are called hotshots. And so a hotshot is a trucking firm 
that is on call 24 hours a day to bring goods from a oil rig or to a production platform or to fly it offshore. Um, to give you an idea of why, so um, a drilling rig are rented, by the way. They're not owned by the oil companies. And so they'll rent them for like $400,000 a day. Drilling ships are somewhere to the two and a half million dollars a day. Now, can you imagine if a drilling rig goes down just because of one hose, which has happened, all right? Time becomes the essence. And a hotshot is a specialized intermediary. They drop everything they do, they break every law they have to, and they get the goods there when when they can. And so that's an example of a specialized intermediary. Third, so if you ever go drive by modern Toyota or by the Buick place, you'll see hundreds of cars out there, hundreds. And so just think about that. The average cost, those are franchises. They have to actually buy those cars from the manufacturers and put them on their lots in order for them to be sold. So if you've got 20 cars, let's say 200 cars at $20,000 a piece, that's $4 million in inventory. How does a modern um, automobile dealership handle that? This way it does. There's a specialized intermediary. It's either Westinghouse or GE Capital. So modern Subaru goes, hey, we got 200 cars coming in. They call Westinghouse and they say, I need $4 million. And Westinghouse says, we'll cut you a check. And so that day, Westinghouse cuts a check for $4 million. So 200 cars come in. Let's say that month they sell 100 cars. Okay. So what they do is the end of that month, they cut a check to Westinghouse to pay for those 100 vehicles and then pay the interest on the remaining 100 cars. Without warehousing, which that is called, modern kinds of work just simply can't happen because the numbers are just too big. And those are the functions of a specialized intermediary. They don't actually get intimate with the channel process, but without them, they just simply couldn't survive. The last test question, end user. The downstream channel member, by the way, upstream is manufacturer, downstream is the end user. And when you're talking about upstream, you're going up to the manufacturer and downstream is going down to the end. And you can visit anywhere as well. End users are part of our channel system versus supply chain because they perform channel functions just as other channel members do. Consumers, when they shop at Costco, they stock up on paper towels. They do the channel function of physical possession. When they get those paper towels, they break them up. That's breaking bulk. They personally finance the operations themselves, either through cash or through credit. And that is the financing function. They take those paper towels in their car and home. That's the distribution process. I've got a paper coming up that's, that I'm writing that says that the more that we push the channel functions to the consumer, the greater value that they create and ultimately um, create the most utilitarian and hedonic value for consumers. And so these are the three members. Manufacturers, intermediaries, end users, and what else? So the big question is why? Bob Zion. Okay. Why? Why do they exist? Why why all this? I mean, why don't we just buy directly from the manufacturers? Wouldn't it seem simpler that way? Cut everybody out, let the manufacturers just ship directly to me. Just look at all the money I save. They always talk about this marketing and saying, well, marketing gets one third of the cost to everything, maybe. All right. 
but there's other reasons why, okay? So why do they exist? Well, let's talk about what it does for the downstream members. So I want you to think of a supermarket, whatever is your favorite, Harris Teeter, Lowe's, whichever one, and I want you to think of what goes on in the back. So they get shipments from Del Monte, they'll get shipments from Procter & Gamble, uh, they'll get shipments from multiple places, okay? Del Monte will send them peas and corn and all of these other things, and the supplies are basically the mishmash across everything that Del Monte sells, and that is a heterogeneous supply. It's just different stuff. And so the first thing that happens is they start sorting things out. They put the peas over here, the corn over here. They put the other stuff over here. They put the condiments, stuff like mayonnaise, okay, over here. All right, they do all of those things. So that's the first thing they do. Then they get another in, uh, manufacturer. They bring in stuff, similar stuff, and they put their piece next to the Del Monte and their corn next to the Del Monte, and they start doing it. And so then you see the process of what's known as accumulation. They put together similar stocks together. So they're getting a larger team. Then the next thing that they do is they break them down into even smaller and smaller lots. And so let's go to condiments. Let's take the mayonnaise. And the mayonnaise is broken down into smaller groups. And then they put the light mayonnaise together. And then they put the spicy ones together. They take the mustards. They put the yellow mustards together. They put the fancy mustards together. They take the ketchups and they put them together. And they separate and they sort them out. And finally, after you allocate, you've got that assortment built together. So this is this is what a nerd I am, all right? I like to go and count and see how many different mustards you can find at a Harris Teeter versus a Walmart. Now, Walmart is famous for having several of each thing, but not a much of an accumulation. So one day I decided I would go see the mustards that Walmart had and they had about 14 different sizes and standards of mustards. I took a trip to Harris Teeter. Yes, I actually went out of my way and I counted 73 different types of mustards, sizes and tastes. It is amazing, supermarkets, this is just a general conversation. Supermarkets have anywhere from 50 to 150,000 separate items in them. It's just, they, it is amazing in that way. Their average margin is 2%. So think about that. They do a million dollars in sales and they'll make 20 grand once they paid all everything else. Supermarkets, there's two places, by the way, that they make the most money. This isn't chess stuff. I'll, I'll make sure to knock that out. But supermarkets make their most money on meat because they can cut it themselves and the delis. And that's why they promote the delis as much as they do, okay? And so for the downstream members, the greatest advantage for them is they create possession, they create place, and they create time utility. They have the goods when the consumer wants them at the place that they want them. And so this is what the downstream members do. Ultimately, what they do is they create value. It's as simple as that. So one of the things we always talk about, um, what, what makes companies more successful, satisfaction or value? So in the 90s, there was this discussion in, in um, marketing about satisfaction as being the number one way that we can measure success. And then somebody points out Walmart. Who goes into Walmart and says, man, I was really satisfied. I enjoyed the heck out of going to Walmart. We hate it. I mean, Walmart has consistently the lowest satisfaction level of all of the retail outlets. But what keeps it in business? Oh, it's basically the value, 
All right. We go to Walmart because the value that Walmart brings overperforms what we have to give up in order to get to Walmart. Okay. It, it's kind of funny. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the number one corporation that really pushes Walmart around are Dollar Generals. I mean, believe it or not, they can't figure out how to recreate Dollar General. Walmart, like 10 years ago, tried to create a downstream. If you go down to Hickory or to Lenore, there's a neighborhood Walmart store there. It was, it's actually built on a European model. It's brilliant, but it only does fair. Um, and, and I'll give an example. So in Walmart, where do you go to get the milk? Anybody want to guess or anybody even want to try? Where? In the back. So you got to walk past everything else and get all the way to the back. And that's not because they made that up, okay? Anybody know where the milk is in the Dollar General? It's in the front. It's right there in the front, right next to the bacon and eggs, okay? And Dollar General is doing that for a reason. It's an interesting model. We, we had a buyer, and a um, really nice guy, and I talked to him about it. And while a Dollar General had, does two major things, one of them is they try to recreate a model that you can get about 80% of the things that you need that are necessities, you know, fast moving consumer goods at the Dollar General. And look, by the way, where the Dollar Generals are in Boone, they're on the way out on the right side of the street. Okay. So anyway, I'm going on, but I just kind of want to show you how these different models work out. And these are the benefits that the downstream providers have. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay, what is the benefits for the upstream providers? So for the upstream providers, it allows them to make every transaction routine. One of the difficulties is that every transaction, if you wished, could be subject to negotiation over and over again. Walmart started in 1996 what was known as the Continuous Replenishment Program, or CRP. They could have come up with better uh, uh, um, initials on that, but what the heck. Um, Basically, what they did was Walmart, they would contract out for exact number of items in a given year. Now, what they did, however, is they said, but we only want a certain number at a time. And when that number goes under a certain level, we will automatically reissue a purchase order to buy the next allotment. And so that's what the continuous replenishment program does, all right? Now, that increases in profitability, but it requires trust. There must be trust between the channel members in order for that to be successful. Remember this, it is judiciousness. It is the judicious use of your intermediaries that achieves success, not simply how many you actually have. Second thing to the upstream member does is this is also to the very top and the very bottom is it reduces the number of individuals who you have to contact in order to get jobs done. Without intermediaries, every producer would have to interact with every buyer. If I'm a manufacturer of Del Monte of peas, I manufacture in a size known as a skid. And so a skid is generally a pallet worth a pallet may be five feet by five feet in a square and stand about five and a half to six feet high. All right. 
That's how they produce their goods. I can't sell that to the end user. All right. That has to be broken up into smaller sections. And then maybe even smaller still to the retailer till it can be usable by the consumer. Now, if I take that skid and try to sell to 2 million people, it's simply not efficient. Large channel systems actually gain efficiency by the number of people they have in the system. An efficient channel has specialized intermediaries because they help with the transactions. So let me, let me kind of give you an idea of, of this one so that you can understand it better, okay? So this is an example, let's do it this way. Let's think of this. These are manufacturers at the top and these are retailers at the bottom. And so let's say the manufacturers are, what's all the sin stuff? Tobacco, alcohol, um, candy, and soft drinks. Yeah, everything that's bad for you that you love. Okay, so that's all four of those manufacturers, okay? Next, these are all four mom and pop stores in North Carolina, all right? Every one of those mom and pop stores needs those goods in order to survive in the modern world. But if I'm m and candies and I sell on a skid, how can a little mom and pop store possibly survive and buy a skid at a time? Just think of the capital that, that ties up for that poor little store, all right? Same thing with alcohol, beer, you gotta have it in order to be able to survive. But, but how do I buy cases and cases and be able to survive that? You can think of the same thing with tobacco products, and you can think about it with soft drinks. It really becomes difficult. However, think of a centralized system. Let's have one wholesaler. Remember, I said wholesalers are specialized, okay? So let's have one wholesaler who focuses on mom and pop stores. They know each one of these mom and pop store owners by first name. They know exactly their buying habits. They even know their seasonal needs at the same time. They spend time studying these particular stores. Now, let's say these are all the manufacturers. The manufacturers do not want to deal with that. Here's what the wholesaler can do. The wholesaler can come in and collectively take all of the requests from all of these retailers, come back to the wholesaler. The wholesaler can collect all of their smaller parts of requirements together to give one big part. And now they become a strong block in order to negotiate with those people up there. And so this is the win-win situation. This is how a centralized system becomes more efficient. So just to give you an idea, this is Atlantic Dominion Services. They're located here in North Carolina and in this area, and this is exactly it. Okay. Their job is to collect all of this information from mom and pop stores. And they're the ones who do things like food and grocery, tobacco products, beverages, general merchandise, all of those things. They will actually store the goods for you until they need them, until you need them. They can become your warehouses as well. And this is the success of a, a centralized system. The mom and pop stores can only buy what they need. It allows those mom and pop stores to survive when they simply couldn't. And yes, a more complex system is a more efficient. Now, they're actually a one stop if they wanted to, because they will also do things in terms of their services. They have all of those things, but they will also do things like help you negotiate. And they even do vending as well. It's a very collective group. It's very fascinating when I was reading about them. They even do coffee services. They do micro markets, vending stuff. It's, it's really unique corporation.
And it all comes down to their ability to do this. To sell for a single wholesaler, have that wholesaler devote their attention to the success downstream of their of their fellow retailers and ultimately bringing success to the fellow manufacturer. All right, I'm running out of voice. We're done for the day. Y'all have a great weekend. We'll come back Tuesday. We'll start talking about all the other stuff to finish chapter one. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.